And Lord, we ask again that we would hear your voice and your voice alone as you speak to us truth from your word. Your truth is a fount of perfect wisdom. We need wisdom in these days. Grant it as we listen, as we learn, as we study. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. We are going to be proceeding in our study of the book of Colossians this morning. We're in the second chapter. We're going to be looking at verses 18 through 23 today. So if you have your Bibles and you would like to open them to those verses, now would be a good time to do that. Colossians 2, verse 18. Paul writes these as words of encouragement and admonition to the church. Let let no one cheat you of your reward, taking delight in false humility and worship of angels, intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, and not holding fast to the head from whom all the body nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments grows with the increase that is from God. Therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, why, as though living in the world, do you subject yourselves to regulations? Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle, which all concern things which perish with the using, according to the commandments and doctrines of men. These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion, false humility, and neglect of the body, but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. This wonderful reality that is called the information highway to which probably most every one of us avails ourselves on a regular basis is remarkable in all that it's able to teach us and help us to gain access to in terms of knowledge and resources and everything else under the sun. But along with it, there comes some things that we might call the downside to the information highway. Did you know that in this past year, 2022, according to FBI data, criminals made off with over $52 million through over 300,000 phishing schemes in that year. Now, I'm not talking about going out to the lake and casting a hook. There are numerous ways that phishing emails would try to trick those who receive them. They might try to cause you to open a contaminated file or give you fake information about making a payment. I get them all the time. Some would direct you to a a spoof that looks almost exactly like a real website that you use on a regular basis, and they would then steal your login information. Others will ask for a code to authenticate whether or not you are a real person. So I want to tell you, whenever you're traveling that information highway, it's important to be vigilant and to look for things that don't seem to be quite right. I want to tell you something else. The very same thing is also true and happens all too frequently in the spiritual realm. There are those mechanisms that are designed specifically to trip up the sincere believer and to actually deteriorate and ultimately destroy the truth that brings life and light. We talked a little bit about this through the messages that we've been delivering out of this passage, this this little letter that Paul wrote, how there are those who would nuance truth and, and, and maybe alter it just a little bitty tiny bit initially and then continue to move along that pathway until the truth is really undiscernible or undetectable. There are those places that call themselves churches that are now offering trendy talks that are designed to appease worldly desires. And I want to tell you, whenever these things come your way, you better proceed with caution. Because they want to allure us away from the solid truth that is our foundation, which is God's holy word. And so the passage before us warns us of such dedicated deception that endangers 
the reward of believers. I want you to look again at verse 18, that very first line. This is what Paul is encouraging and admonishing the believers about. He says, let no one cheat you of your reward. Now, I want to tell you, that's something that ought to cause us to want to pay attention. If there's a reward, and there is, and there is opportunity for that reward to slip away, and there is, then he says that you and I have some responsibility in this whole process to not allow that to happen. He says, you let no one cheat you. Have you ever been cheated? Have you, have you ever had somebody cheat you out of something? You know the feeling that you get on the other side of something like that? You feel like a heel. You feel kind of dumb. Like, boy, what, happened? what just happened here? But it happens all the time. And, and in this world that we walk through in terms of our faith, there is a reality that we need to, to come up to terms with. And so we, we need to refuse to allow ourselves to be cheated out of what God intends for us to have. That's exactly what happened in the Garden of Eden. God intended that man and that woman that He created to live in that perfect place, in perfect harmony, in perfect serenity, with everything that they would ever need provided for them. And, and yet something came along that caused them to turn away from the God who had this reward appointed to them and to change the outlook of all of it. I want to tell you something. The greatest scam artist of all time is out to cheat you and I out of God's greatest blessings for our lives. And he uses any means at his disposal to do this. So what, what, do, what do scams look like? What, what does a sat satanic scam look like? I want to give you some general characteristics of, of a satanic scam based on scripture, based on experience. First thing I would say about them is that they seem to be legitimate. When, whenever a scam comes your way and you look at it, you think, this could be true. But remember, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. But, but they seem like it's something that could actually hold truth and something that could, could be legitimate if you, if you look at it carefully enough. Secondly, the second general characteristic of Satan's scams and schemes is that they're often very enticing. What, what he seems to offer us is always maybe appealing at some level to us. And, and sometimes it seems like it's maybe an easier path than gripping and adhering to the truth of God's Word. So, so they're an enticing thing. They, they seem to appeal to us. They are alluring and, and they're often enthusiastically supported. A lot of times the, the schemes and the scams that Satan presents, even, even if he calls them truth, are widely supported by a host of people who've bought into that lie and think that it's the next best thing. And so whenever we begin to think about the, the, the scheming and the, the scamming of the enemy of the soul, we need to realize that he's pretty good at what he does. And, and in this particular instance, what happens is that uh, Paul is writing to them about not only this possibility, but this reality that they're facing. W.E. Vines, who wrote the expository or compiled the expository dictionary of the New Testament, speaks about what it is that we stand to lose, this reward. He says that this is like a prize in an event in which you emerge the victor and you're to be awarded this prize. And he says that if you fall by the wayside, if somehow or another you're distracted, if somehow or another you don't finish the race or you don't finish the race well, he says that you'll lose this award that God intends for you to have because the award will be withheld due to some violation. The Col Colossian Christians, he says, tend, they stand to lose God's intended reward by being scammed by what Paul is identifying as false teaching and false teachers. So what does this specific scam look like? This specific scam is presented to the church in Paul's day by a group of people that are called Judaizers. Let me talk about them for just a few moments. Look at what he says about them here. He says, this is how they operate. He says, first of all, they take delight in false humility and worship angels. They intrude into things they haven't seen. They're vainly puffed up by, by a fleshly mind, not holding fast to the head from whom the whole, all the body is nourished and knit together 
by joints and ligaments and growing with the increase that is from God. So, he characterizes these Judaizers. Now, the Judaizers were those we talked about last week who had this intentional determination to try to force people to take on the, uh, the, the ceremonial, ritualistic rites of Judaistic law, and that if they didn't, then they were told that they, could, they couldn't be saved. They were not really Christians if they weren't willing to undergo all these rites, these rituals, these ceremonies, these symbolic things that are meant to celebrate and identify surrender to God. And so he basically says to the, these people that he's writing to, he says these Judaizers are coming in and they're presenting themselves in such a way that it might seem like something that you would want to be drawn to. But he says you need to be careful because what they're doing is they're trying to cheat you of the reward of the great blessing God has for you. So what does he say about them? He says, first of all, that they have a false humility. A false humility. Now, this is, this is people who present themselves as though they are humble and they, they really act as though everything that they're doing is for the benefit of others. But in truth, what, what they have is a pridefulness in their own rituals and their own religious practices that causes them to hold those things up as the regulatory means by which you can be right in the sight of God. So, so they're, they're prideful in their rituals. They're prideful in their works that they present one way attitudinally, but then in action, their, their, there's, their life is entirely different. He says something else about them. He says they practice the worship of angels. In, in other words, it's, it's kind of one of those anything goes type of religious practices. Anything that, that resembles or looks like it might be from God is fair game. And so even if angels come through, they worship them as though they were they were. Uh, worshipful beings. He says also that they are speaking about things, intruding into things which they've not seen. So these people are trying to explain and to express and to actually force people into a fellowship of their methodology and their means, and they're attributing and attaching that to a relationship with Jesus Christ, but they haven't even seen Jesus Christ. He says they're intruding into things which they've not seen. Now, Paul, as the author of this, this document, has seen Jesus Christ on the Damascus Road. He had an encounter with him that was real and personal by which his apostleship was derived. The followers of Jesus understood. And if you look in John's gospel, whenever he, I mean, John's letter that he wrote to the church, he says, I'm writing to you about things that I've seen, things that I've heard, things that we've touched and handled with our hands. We're talking to you about a Jesus that we know. And he says, what you're getting here is a version of Jesus from people that do not know him. They've not encountered him. They don't know him like we know him because we've been with him. And so he says they're intruding into things that they've not seen. They've had no encounter with the risen Christ. And then he says that not only that, that they're vainly puffed up by a fleshly mind. So essentially what he's saying about them is that, that they have come to the place where they're, they're so proud of what they've accomplished in terms of the works and rituals that they've undergone. They've got this great big resume. They've got this great big story about who they are and what they've done for Christ and what they've done in terms of their religious actions that has caused them to be puffed up. They're prideful. In other words, that they hold themselves up to be the standard by which everyone's else, everyone else's life is to be measured. Fleshly, he says. They're of the flesh. What they do is of the flesh. They have a fleshly mind. They're all about performance. They're all about the, 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 the viewpoint that other people have about them. And he says they are not centered in Christ. They're not holding fast to the head from whom all the body nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments grows with the increase that is from God. So he's speaking here about some people who have stepped away from, from the Christology, the, the Christ-centered faith that was delivered to them that they've supposedly trusted in. And they've altered it and they've changed it and they've made it about rituals and activities and religious work. And they've become prideful in all that they've accomplished and all that they've performed. And then they point to themselves more than they point to Christ. I want to tell you something. Whenever we come to a place in our lives where Christ is not the head over all and the center of all in all, then we've gotten off track. 
If we think that everything that happens in a place is about ourselves or about a, a, a church or a location or anything other than Jesus Christ, we have gotten off base. And, and it's time for the church to exalt and raise up and lift up and magnify the name of the Lord Jesus Christ in a world where darkness is so prevalent and so predominant that they need to see the light of the gospel of Jesus. So what he says here is that for those who have presented this, there, there is damage that is caused by those who would fall for these schemes. Verse number 20 he says, Therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, why, as though living in the world, do you subject yourselves to, re to regulations? Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle, which all concern things which perish with the using according to the commandments and doctrines of men. So he says that, that if, if you lean that way, if you follow the leading of these false teachings, if you follow the teachings of those who are preaching a gospel of appeasement, a gospel that, that sounds good, that's alluring and attractive, that because of all the works that you perform to make yourself somebody and exalt yourself within that, that particular uh, strain of belief, he says that, that you're, you're following something that is causing you to not only miss your reward, but to choose some things that are damaging to your spiritual journey. What does he say those things are? The first thing he mentions is unnecessary subjugation to a lot of man-made regulations. He says, why? If you died with Christ, why would you live in the world as though you're subject to all these regulations that have been nailed to the cross in the person and work of the Lord Jesus. Listen to me. I, I believe that, that we have a system that we need to follow in order to carry on and carry out our relationship with God. But I want to tell you that that system is always meant to bring us further in our relationship with Christ than we are without it. We, we talked about the need to be ordered and disciplined in our spiritual journey. But we also need to realize that just doing these things has no meaning whatsoever if Christ is not the goal, if Christ is not the prize. That's, that's why Paul said, I run as one who wants to win the prize. He said, I haven't attained already, but I'm continuing forward to the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. He says, I'm pursuing Christ. I want Jesus. I want to know Him more. I want to know Him in the fellowship of His sufferings. I want to know Him in the power of His resurrection. I want to know Him as fully as He can be known. And that was the driving force of Paul's life. And so he's saying, why would you substitute that opportunity to know Jesus for just carrying out a bunch of rules and regulations that are made by men, that are spoken by men to try to get you into a, a, a journey that isn't even faith-related, but it's all about works? Why would you do that? So he says, you're unnecessarily subjugating yourself to reg regulations. So he says also that you're pursuing mythological deceiving lies that are misleading you. He says, you died with Christ. Why would you follow these things that, are, that have no capacity to, to, to bring you to a place of fullness and faith in the Lord Jesus? He says, all these things will perish with the using. Everything that, you're, everything that they're putting out in front of you is going to perish with the using according to the commandment and doctrines of men. So there's the myth. The myth is that if you do these things, that they'll satisfy your soul, that they'll appease you. That, that they will make you full on the inside, that they'll complete your joy. But, it, but the myth is that, that when it's all said and done, all you've done, is, done is, is performed a lot of rules and checked a lot of boxes, but you haven't drawn any closer to Christ, who is the wellspring of life. You haven't, you haven't drank any more deeply from the Holy Spirit of God, who is the source of power and fullness. So the myth is that these things will appease you. And so they're, they're being deceived and misled if they follow off after this. And so Paul is saying, don't let your, yourself be cheated of the reward that God has for you. What is that reward? It's the fullness that comes whenever we're consumed with Christ and He has filled us completely. That's the reward of this. Jesus is our reward. 
So Paul is adamant in expressing and explaining that these people that are trying to teach and lead the Colossian believers, that they're just empty, and that what they're offering is no substitute for the satisfaction that comes from walking with Jesus Christ. So, we need to understand that we have a part in this. He says, you let no one, you determine, you make a choice, you decide, you set yourself up to experience the fullness of what God has for you and refuse to allow anyone or anything to take away from you what God has intended for you in terms of his blessings. So he says, this is on you, it's on us. So it, it appears that avoiding the, the scams and the schemes of the enemy requires deliberate, active resistance on our part. It's something that we have to take up. We can't just walk through life with blinders on, acting as though there's, there's no attack on the truth. We can't remove ourselves from the fray and hope that everything's going to work out all right. If, if we want to experience the fullness and the victory that God has for us through His Son Jesus, then we have to take this up. So, how do we do it? What's, what's ahead for us? Three things I want to share with you. The first one is this. You need to determine in your heart that you will refuse to be cheated of your reward. You need to come to terms with the reality that spiritual scamming is a real thing and you need to resist it with all of your might. So basically what I'm saying to you is this, that right here, right now, today, you need to make a stand. You need to make a determination. And you need to say, you know what? I'm going to live in the fullness of everything God has for me. I'm not going to let the enemy steal, kill, or destroy what God has in store for me. I want the fullness of His blessing in my life. And I know that that comes in the person of His Son, the Lord Jesus. And, and I'm not going to let anybody diminish Him or dilute Him or water Him down in any way to me. I'm going to take Him as Scripture presents Him. And I'm going to live my life fully for Him. So you need to resist the determination of the enemy to destroy that. Secondly, we need to develop the ability to discern between truth and error. How do we do that? How do we, how do we discern between truth and error? Uh, turn back to John chapter 8 real quickly. And I want you to see whenever Jesus is addressing the very work of the enemy and he, he, he says to those who are, are, are weighing what he says as truth, and this is what he says in verse 31. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The truth by knowing the truth, by staying in the Word, you shall know the truth. And it's the truth that will set you free from the lies and the deception that the enemy wants to present. It's the truth that will help you to, to look at all the nuanced versions of Christianity and faith systems that are being presented and propagated in our world. It's the truth of God's Word as a whole that will help you to know where, what is error and what is truth? You shall know the truth when you abide in the Word of God. And that's the place to find it. So you need to develop the ability to discern between truth and error. And I want to tell you that a 30-minute Bible lesson on Sunday morning and a 15-minute sermon by the pastor is not going to get you there. Right? You, you'll never get a 15-minute sermon from the pastor anyway. So, that's, But I'm just telling you that, that that's not enough. You have to decide that this Word of God is not only sufficient, but it's essential 
to help you as the world bombards you with its versions of misleading, errant teaching. You have to stay in the Word. You have to get the Word in your life. Thirdly, I would say that we need to delete from our lives anything that has no eternal value. We, we spend so much of our energy and our resources pursuing so many activities and opportunities that have absolutely no eternal value. And, and, and we need to be willing to trim some things away that don't matter when it's all said and done. I was sharing with, uh, with our men, we were talking about the, this, this, this baseball event that's been going on and, and some of the disappointments for some of us and the joys for others. And uh, when we, we were having our prayer time and, and when it was all kind of ready to conclude that part of the conversation, I said to them, I said, I really appreciate most of all what Nathaniel Lowe had to say who he and his brother are playing on opposite teams. His brother's playing on a team we beat out, by the way. But they're playing on opposite teams. And they're both watching their mother battle cancer, a, a deadly cancer. And this is what he said whenever somebody talked to him about baseball. He said, at the end of the day, I want to tell you that there are a whole lot of things that are much more important in life than baseball. And boy, I'm a fan, I'll tell you I am. But, but I'll tell you this, he's got some things categorized in his mind like we need to do. And we, we need to be willing to, to weigh the things that we're pursuing with all of our energy and our resources and to say, is Christ the center of that? Is Christ the most important thing to me? Or am I giving myself away to a lot of other things that are less significant? And at the end of the day, they're all, as he says, going to perish anyway. And am I willing to trim away from my life things that may not matter when it's all said and done, if necessary? And I'm not here to make a list of things you need to include in your life or get rid of. I know that we all have a lot of things that we enjoy. And I'm not, I'm not here to be the, the, the guy that says, no, you, you can't have any fun. You can't do anything that's relaxing. I'm not here to say that today. But I'm saying to us this morning that if there's something that's, that's taking away from our relationship with Jesus or causing it to look differently than Scripture intends for it to look, we need to evaluate that and we need to be honest with it. And, and if you're waiting on, on me to sit up here and say, well, that's okay. You can go ahead and do those things. You will not ever hear me say that. And I have to do that in my own life as well. I have, to, I have to work on my own determination to stay focused on God's truth and to let God's truth determine choices that I make in my life. I have to decide that. And that's where we are. Paul writes more than once, but he writes very clearly in another letter to another church. He said this, he said, whether you eat or whether you drink, whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God. And I think at the end of the day, that's, that's the ultimate question, is are we doing what we're doing with, with that figuring into it? How can what I do be done in such a way that it can bring honor and glory to God? That's what's important. It's really what matters. You know, if you... If you like to fish like I do or hunt like I do or watch baseball games like I do or whatever, all those different things, you need to do that with that, that overarching question, how can I do these things in such a way that somehow I can honor God in it? How can I do that? And once we answer that question, then away we go. And if, if the answer to that question is, well, there's no way that I can, we may need to reevaluate and think things through. Listen. We live in a world where everything is upside down, where the truth is less desirable to the world than the lie, where the bad, the evil, is more desirable to the world than the good. We, we live in a world where right now there is no, there is no gray area in terms of the, the, the culture of true Christianity and the culture of a world apart from Christ. We don't have to wonder if there's any blending, if there's any bleeding over, because there's just not. It's clear. It's clear cut. 
And, and it's time for the church to embrace the gospel of Jesus Christ with confidence and boldness, as Paul talked about in Acts, and, and to share the truth with the world, whether the world sees it that way or not. So we need to be faithful. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads, please. This morning you might be in this room and you might have been living your life just believing that checking the boxes, doing the, the works, showing up at church, giving some money, helping on a committee or whatever, or, or just being a presence in a pew, you, you, you might have thought that that's, that's all you need. But I'm telling you, it's not. We all need Jesus. We need Jesus. And we need him desperately. And so this morning, I want to ask you a question. Not have you been to church, not even have you been to the baptistry, not have you been to Sunday school, but have you come to Jesus? Have you entrusted your life and your eternity to Him? Have you surrendered your heart and your soul to His Lordship? Have you pleaded with Him to forgive you for your sins and to cause you to be right in the sight of God? If not, this morning, I want to plead with you. And I want to offer you the opportunity here today to take that step, that first step, in moving into a life that is eternally sealed and secured in Jesus Christ, where you can spend forever with Him in heaven. In just a moment, our ministers will be down front, myself included. And if you would like to come to any one of us and and begin to explore what that looks like. Maybe understand a little bit more completely. Maybe you're here and you don't understand, but you want to. Listen, we're here to try to help. We're here to try to, to guide you and, and provide information and insight and understanding into how you can be saved today, how you can be forgiven of your sins. Maybe you're here and there's something else going on in your life that you, you need to pray prayer about or prayer to pray with somebody about. We'd be honored to do that as well. If you're here and there's anything going on in your life that you just need somebody to, to be a listening ear or to, to share a word of prayer with you, we're, we want to do that today. So I'm going to pray and then we're going to be down front as the music plays. We're going to ask you to step out if God prompts you to do so. So why don't you stand with your heads bowed and I'll lead us in prayer. Father, we come in Jesus' name to ask that your Holy Spirit would have freedom to move and to work in our lives right here, right now so that we can know exactly what you want us to do. And as we hear your voice, may we respond in obedience. And if that means that we need to step forward and try to gain better insight into what's going on in our lives, help us to have the courage to do that. In Jesus' name we ask. You come as God speaks this morning.